All right, everyone. So in this video, we're going to actually break down some of the techniques that H.P. Lovecraft uses in his prose and discuss the Call of Cthulhu bas-relief, this depiction of the creature Cthulhu that's created by Wilcox in a kind of dream fugue state. What we have here is an artist's depiction of that Cthulhu bas-relief. I'd like you to look at the passage wherein Lovecraft describes this bas-relief. And here we have it. We're going to analyze this and look at how Lovecraft is creating the sensations of cosmicism, saying that we're dealing with something that is unknowable, undescribable, unnameable, something that's beyond all of our categories, beyond all of our understanding. He's creating both epistemological horror and existential horror at the same time things we discussed in relation to the introduction of the Call of Cthulhu in our synchronous lesson. It seemed to be a sort of monster or symbol representing a monster of a form which only a diseased fancy could conceive. If I say that my somewhat extravagant imagination yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, and a human caricature, I shall not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. A pulpy, tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings but it was the general outline of the whole which made it most shockingly frightful. Behind the figure was a vague suggestion of a Cyclopean architectural background. What I'd like you to do is to take a look at that passage and consider two questions. What kinds of techniques does Lovecraft use to A, create the sensations associated with the weird, so the sensations of the weird, cosmic dread that we've discussed, and B, evoke cosmicism, H.P. Lovecraft's literary philosophy? Consider things like diction, imagery, word choice, the evolution of words, the evolution of sentences and ideas inside that passage. And two, let's take this passage and completely modify it. Let's change it into the writing of another author, in essence. Let's strip away some of the elements and leave it with its base description. How would the effect of the passage change if it simply read, Thus, it was a monster of a form which only a diseased fancy could conceive. It was a combination of an octopus, a dragon, and a human caricature. A pulpy, tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings. Behind the figure was a vague suggestion of a Cyclopean architectural background. How does this alteration to Lovecraft's prose change the effect? The same information seems to be conveyed, but in a slightly different way. How has this alteration changed the emotional impact, the intellectual impact, the thematic impact of this description. Take about eight minutes, pause the video, think about these two questions, and then when you return, I'll go over a few of my own answers, and we'll look at other uh, ways in which Lovecraft modulates his prose in this story in order to create the effects he desires. All right. So, the kind of techniques that Lovecraft employs here and their implications. What we have in this passage are a series of very carefully constructed uh, prose techniques that are designed to create an appropriate feeling and also to remind us continually, without ever saying it, that we can't truly understand what Cthulhu looks like. And it's all couched in the reality that we're not even looking at Cthulhu. We're looking at something that an artist created from his dream that was inspired by the dreams of the actual creature. We're at four levels of distance here. That distancing factor is critical. In this story, we're constantly circling around Cthulhu. Right? We have all these different media through which we encounter Cthulhu. At one point, we have uh, William Channing Webb narrating his encounter with the Eskimo or Inuit, if we want to use a, a, an appropriate term, but in the story they're called Eskimo. He narrates his encounter with them. That story is then told to Inspector Legrasse. Inspector Legrasse records it in a document that is brought to the um, grandfather of the narrator, or granduncle, William Engel. And then the narrator reads that and reports it to us. And we're not getting it from him directly. We're getting it through something that he has written. So think about how many levels we are removed from the real Cthulhu. We can never actually approach the real Cthulhu. We can never see him. We can never touch him. We can never understand him. We're always circling around here on the outermost edges of the real thing, the thing in itself. 
We can never actually access him because he's so distant. He's so far. He's so beyond our ability to grapple with. That it's in itself, the structure of the story is a reflection of Lovecraft's attempt to construct this creature that can't be described, can't be named. We can only ever get maybe five levels away from him. That's as far as we can ever come or as close as we can ever come to the real thing or the thing itself and grappling with it. And Lovecraft uses his prose style in this moment to reflect that reality, that we can never understand Cthulhu, we can never understand the true nature of the cosmos that he represents, we can never really even approach it. And as a result, we learn or we understand that our knowledge and capacity for knowledge, our position in the universe, are utterly insignificant. So let's take a look at this particular passage and some of the techniques that he uses. That distancing factor is in play here. Just as in the story, we have all these levels or layers of narration that separate us from the actual story. So too, in the description of the Cthulhu bas-relief, which is not even Cthulhu himself, right? It's several levels removed from Cthulhu. So too, have we ha do we have all these distancing forces that suggest to us that there's something there beyond that which can possibly be described by human language. Look at the levels of distance that the narrator uh, applies for us. He downplays the effects of what he sees by saying that it's the result of extravagant imagination. So again, we're given this outlet to say that the narrator has envisioned something that's beyond us because his imagination is so extravagant. He is not saying this is what it looks like. He's again distancing us. He's saying, I can't actually describe it. All I can do is give you something, I can suggest something about it, that is not unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. It's not an accurate description. A try as he might. And then he takes us one step further away from Cthulhu himself. We're already several because this is the bas relief that represents something that somebody saw in a dream that was a reflection of the dream of Cthulhu that is just a reflection of him, the creature itself. But here, we're taking another step away because he says, no, what I've just described to you isn't accurate. Ignore the surface elements and focus on the general outline of the thing. There's something about it in its overall impression that no amount of compartmentalization and breaking down can actually describe. I've tried to give you that general outline by saying there are these, it's like a dragon, human, octopus, but that's not enough. Then I go into the description and I start breaking it down. Okay, I, maybe if I focus on this pulpy head, I can, I can describe it. Well, no, right? I'm going to break it down, this whole thing, into its constituent parts, the head, the wings, the arms. I'm going to give you a, as tense and as detailed a description of the thing as I can. But even after that, he says, it's not any of those one things. It's not any one thing. It's not even what each part looks like. Because when I look at the general outline of the whole, there's something that transcends any one of its parts and the combination of all of its parts. Lovecraft here, through the tortured descriptions of the narrator, as he desperately tries to convey the sense of horror that he feels when looking at it, breaking down the object into its parts so he can say, well, this is the precise combination of things that make me feel this way. This is what it looks like, and I can't gesture towards what it, the whole expression of it, so maybe if I look at just a piece of it, one piece at a time, then I can accurately convey how it feels. It doesn't work. So he's desperate to describe it, to break it down, to give it names, to look at its pieces, but he can't. The further down he goes, the more impossible it is for him to describe the totality of it that transcends the combination of each of the little parts. There's a gap between that which cannot be understood and those vaguely relevant attempts to describe it. Something about this creature or something about this work of art that isn't even the creature itself, goes beyond any of our attempts to describe it. And Lovecraft is very careful in the prose techniques that he uses here, the way in which he describes the creature, in order to show us that it is undescribable. He doesn't tell us, oh, I couldn't describe it. The narrator tries desperately to describe it, but all of his descriptions come up short. So when some people would say that, well, Lovecraft is a poor author, right? This is one of the things I would point them to to suggest otherwise. Lovecraft is not somebody who would just go and say, well, 
the thing is unnameable or the thing is undescribable. In his earlier works, when he was a, a sort of juvenile author, he would do that. But by this point in his career, he's understood how to carefully manipulate and structure his prose, his language, and the gradual revelations and failures of revelation in such a passage to properly articulate, to show us rather than tell us that this thing, whatever it is, is unnameable, undescribable, incomprehensible. The reality of this thing is beyond impossible. It's beyond our capacity to understand, describe, compartmentalize, and break down. This assertion that Cthulhu, or this demonstration that Cthulhu is beyond description, has philosophical implications. Remember that Cthulhu is not just a monster. It's a representation of Lovecraft's view of the universe, a universe that is alien, hostile, but only hostile by its nature and not by inclination. There's nothing out there to be hostile. It's just us, right? In that William Golding co quotation that I discussed with you, right? Maybe it's only us. For Lovecraft, that's true. It is only us. And the universe is just this blind, chaotic, purposeless morass that cares nothing for us, that cares nothing for morality or what we purport to be morality. It's utterly uncaring and utterly incomprehensible because it's beyond our feeble uh, capacities, our mental capacities to understand. Cthulhu is a representation symbolically of that universe and of that reality. So behind that description is a kind of philosophy, right? There's a, a philosophy of the world itself, of ontology and metaphysics. And we're going to take a look at some of those philosophical implications. But in order to understand them, I'm going to have to delve into some, well, material pertaining to philosophy. We're going to talk about David Hume and his views on how we can actually imagine things, how we understand things in this world, how we form mental pictures of things that don't exist. Now, David Hume, as a philosopher, considers innumerable things. Obviously, he's a philosopher. One of the things that we're going to focus on, though, is his view of the mind and how the mind works in order to create mental pictures or mental images of things. Now, this is not a philosophy course. So I'm going to give you as light an overview of this concept as I can. And there are going to be some oversimplifications along the way in order to suit our purposes and the, the intentions behind an English course. But we want to get a general understanding of what Hume has to say on this subject of mental pictures and take his philosophy and use that as a lens to better understand the philosophical implications of H.P. Lovecraft's description of Cthulhu and the implications of cosmicism. As a brief review of what we said before we move on to Hume, in his attempt to reflect cosmicism through his prose, Lovecraft will demonstrate to us that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. A description of Cthulhu cannot capture the spirit of the thing. He doesn't say, I've captured the spirit of the thing. He says, I will not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. That double negative tells us that there's this series of distancing factors. The speaker tries to capture the thing in itself. He tries to describe the thing in itself, and he can't even describe that. There's no ability to compartmentalize or break down the whole into its constituent parts. A description of all those minute things in as exacting detail as he can provide doesn't reflect the general outline. It doesn't actually achieve a reflection of the totality of its being. So for Lovecraft, in this sort of philosophical statement or reflection of cosmicism in the description of Cthulhu, the encounter with the cosmic elements, the encounter with the universe itself, reveals our limitations, the limitations of our language, of our understanding of natural laws or what we believe to be natural laws, our ways of thinking, and of our nature itself. And to better understand how Lovecraft conveys that, we're going to look at Hume's philosophy. Lovecraft's presentation of the Cthulhu bas relief and the inability of the constituent elements of the whole to actually aggregate into the whole, to properly reflect the whole, is a kind of anti Humean sentiment. Hume said that in the end, when we imagine something, we essentially are taking categories, mental categories, and aggregating qualities. Objects in themselves are just bundles of qualities and attributes. So when I think of, let's say, a horse, I take the various different qualities that a horse possesses, let's say, four-legged, furred, large, heavy. I take all those categories, and then I aggregate them together into a bundle inside my mind. 
And that's how I think of a horse. That's what the idea of a horse is in my mind. It's this aggregation of all these metaphysical descriptors or qualities or attributes. Now, I can imagine things that don't exist or things that I've never seen by joining together some of these qualities and attributes that don't exist or that I haven't seen combined. So for example, I have never seen a mountain of gold. However, I have seen a mountain and I've seen gold. And so when I think of or I imagine this mountain of gold, I can create the concept of a mountain of gold. I can picture that mountain of gold by aggregating all the different qualities or attributes of gold and mountain. So I know that a mountain has the qualities of being large and imposing and heavy. I know that gold has the qualities or in fact is the qualities. Right? It is just this bundle of qualities like yellow, precious, um, expensive, soft, metal. I can take all those qualities, aggregate them together, and then that becomes the idea of gold that I have in my mind. That's all that the idea of gold is, this aggregation of different qualities. If I want to envision or create a mental picture or imagine a, uh, a mountain of gold, then I take those qualities associated with a mountain and those qualities associated with gold and put them together and suddenly I have a mountain of gold. That faculty of our mind, according to Hume and his philosophy of the mind, allows us to envision things that don't exist. It's merely based on the addition or the modification of pre-existing categories and qualities or attributes associated with a, an existing mental image or a fusion of existing mental images. So for instance, if I want to imagine a centaur, I've never seen one, but I can see one in my mind. I can create the image, I can imagine it. How do I do that? I do that according to Hume, in this oversimplification of what he was saying, but I do that according to Hume by taking all the qualities associated with a horse and all those qualities associated with a human being and fitting them together in the proper proportions. Or if I want to imagine something that is completely impossible, something that doesn't exist, like a, a unicorn, I can do the same thing. I take the qualities associated with a horse, large, heavy, four-legged, uh, something that you can ride, etc., And then I fuse them together, the categories of, let's say, a horn, bone, sharp, dangerous, pointed, and suddenly I sort of stick the mental qualities of the horn onto the mental qualities or attributes of the horse, just as I would stick the unicorn horn onto the horse to create a unicorn. And suddenly I have the mental picture of a unicorn. What we take away from Hume's definition of mental pictures, of those things that we can imagination, by way of combinations and fusions to create new imagined concepts, is that a thing's qualities, its attributes, are the thing in itself. A human being is no more and no less than the aggregation of the qualities that it has. Now, this is true mentally, and it's true metaphysically. We won't get into the nitty-gritty of metaphysics, because that is, that's a whole course. Uh, not an English course, either. It's a philosophy course. But the point is that a thing is just its qualities. A thing is just those descriptors that make it up metaphysically. Lovecraft, personally, may be Humean. He might believe this sort of thing. But in his fiction, in order to create the sensations that he desires, he is anti human in his prose techniques. The fusion of known categories is not sufficient to capture the reality of Cthulhu. He can take all the qualities of a human being, character, all the qualities of a dragon, and all the qualities of an octopus, fuse them together, and it's not enough. It's still not enough. That's what it looks like. But it's not what it is. The general outline, the totality of it, the spirit of the thing, transcends the fusion of all those qualities that make it up. The object is so alien that it transcends our categories and the elements of its own description. So remember, again, ontological horror. Ontological horror occurs when we have categories that are fused together. Two categories that shouldn't exist together, that should be distinct, are suddenly blurred and merged into one. Cthulhu sounds at the outset as if he might be that, as Lovecraft begins aggregating these qualities or these attributes from, well, an octopus, an animal, a dragon, a mythological creature, and a human being. And suddenly we have all three of these categories merging together into one. Ontological horror, right? No. Because after he does that, after he does something that in supernatural weird tales is the most horrifying thing you can imagine, right? This aggregation of, of categories that shouldn't come together. After he does that, 
he tells us, or rather he shows us through carefully developed prose, that that alone is not enough to capture what this thing actually is. In reality, it's far beyond that. It's so far beyond any of our existing known categories that even as we desperately, torturously try to fuse them together and describe it in all of its constituent parts, even then, as we encounter that horror, there's a far greater horror beyond it. Because even after doing that, we still haven't gotten at the spirit of the thing. The spirit of the thing lies beyond our categories and any possible combination of our categories. We don't have the language for it. We don't have the ideas for it. We don't have the spirit for it. We don't have the nature for it. Because in our nature, we don't have the capacity to grapple with it. So philosophically, in terms of his language, in terms of his imagery, Lovecraft demonstrates to us the incomprehensibility and the impossibility, the unnameability of Cthulhu. And it's not even Cthulhu. It's the Cthulhu Bar Relief, a work of art created by a human being based on a dream as a result of telepathic contact with the thing in itself. We can never even come close to the thing in itself. We can never come close to knowing or to even encountering the true nature of the universe that Cthulhu represents. In the words of Leonardo da Vinci from that uh, clip from Star Trek Voyager, when she is talking with Captain Janeway, my mind is just too small. Our minds are just too small to ever possibly understand any of this, to ever grapple with the thing in itself. One last prose technique to discuss with you how Lovecraft creates the feelings associated with the weird and of cosmicism, how he tries to destabilize us and take us outside of the norm, outside of the known. And that is a kind of kaleidoscopic technique. If you don't know what a kaleidoscope is, you can take a look at uh, the video that I have posted in the description for this, uh, uh, this lecture. Towards the end of the story, when Johansson is fleeing from Cthulhu, and after he has burst Cthulhu, Cthulhu sinks back under the waves. Lovecraft says this, that was all. After that, Johansson only brooded over the idol in the cabin and attended to a few matters of food for himself and the laughing maniac by his side. He did not try to navigate after the first bold flight, for the reaction had taken something out of his soul. Then came the storm of April 2nd and a gathering of the clouds about his consciousness. There's a sense of spectral whirring through liquid gulfs of infinity, of dizzying rides through reeling universes on a cosmic tail of hysterical plunges from the pit to the moon and from the moon back again to the pit, all livened by a chanting chorus of the distorted, hilarious elder gods and the green bat-winged mocking imps of Tartarus. What we have here is an example of Lovecraft's kaleidoscopic prose technique. We have Johansson being wrenched violently from one image to the next, from the moon and back, or to the moon and back into the deepest pits of hell and Tartarus and night. The kaleidoscope is this infinitely moving series of images as we're wrenched back and forth between different uh, scenes, right, through this myriad explosion of colors and images and sensations. Lovecraft will oftentimes present to us moments that are not deep and baroque and rich and complex. Look at everything that has been done in just one sentence. In this one long, expansive sentence, this man is wrenched back and forth between innumerable different incomprehensible scenes, described in almost like vivid, rapid detail. We too, inside Lovecraft's prose, experience the same thing that he does, being jerked back and forth between all these myriad variegated scenes. There's a confused whirling sensation evoked by his prose that we can't understand or actually visualize because we're wrenched out of each scene so quickly. Rather than being dense and overly elaborate, Lovecraft in this one sentence shows us how quickly he can establish this image that is only partial because he only wants us to be able to understand or to feel that moment temporarily before we're wrenched into a new scene in this kaleidoscopic melange and shifting between different experiences. To take us down from the deepest pits of Tartarus into the depths of space riding on a comet's tail to the moon and back. And it's all livened by the distorted, hilarious elder gods chanting and the green bat wing mocking imps of Tartarus. What he leaves out in these descriptions allows our imagination to fill in, while leaving us destabilized, as destabilized as Johansson himself.
And the allusions to all these different mythological systems, real and imagined, the ones that have been created by Lovecraft and the ones that are pre-existent, give a sense of verisimilitude. They ground us. I understand what the imps of Tartarus are in the sense that they're a piece of human mythology, but a sense of realism and grounding is afforded to the things that are beyond our understanding, the things that don't exist because they're juxtaposed or they are yoked together in a list with the things that we do understand. So, if you remember nothing else, remember this. Lovecraft is a phenomenal author. He might not be um, an author that is to our taste, but the techniques he uses are eminently complex, highly considered, and extremely effective at creating the sensations that he desires. One simply has to lose oneself to the prose, get lost inside the feeling that he's trying to create, or to parse out the language and understand it in exacting detail. Everything that he does, every word that he writes, particularly as he moves into his mature phase, is meticulously and carefully crafted to create the sensation and to convey the philosophy that he desires.